Um, I, I got too excited about introducing our moderator. So <laughs> I'll, I'll tap into that excitement once again. Um, so I wanted to introduce you uh, to Lisa Nye. Lisa Nye is a lead for Indigenous engagement uh, and a board member ex extraordinaire of IPAC Vancouver. And I will be remiss if I didn't take a moment to recognize her years of contribution on the board. Uh, you know, she's a strong advocate uh, for seeing good ideas come to fruition, and today's event is not an exception. Um, with that, Lisa, the stage is all yours. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, On. Um, really appreciate it. Um, so I, I, I am joining you today from the unceded and traditional territories. Sorry, my screen uh, of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. I'm so honored to live with my family on these beautiful and rich lands. I honor and respect that I am a visitor on these lands and work to build and nurture respectful and enduring relationships with these lands and the indigenous peoples who have lived on these lands since time immemorial. I am also so pleased to introduce uh, our speaker and our discussion topic today. Uh, so honored to have Dr. Quinlis, Jacqueline Quinlis, with us. We are humbled and um, uh, really look forward to uh, our, our discussion. Jacqueline Quinlis um, lives on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, Wasanich, and Esquimalt nations on Vancouver Island with her children. Jacqueline is a biracial person of Indian ethnicity, Hyderabad and Secunderabad, India, and Irish British ancestry also. She holds a PhD in sociology with a focus on the health, anti racism, anti colonialism, social inequality, data justice sovereignty and applied stats, decolonization and gender from the University of Victoria. Jacqueline completed a fellowship during her postdoctoral work with the Council on Library and Information Resources in Washington and the University of Victoria, where she focused on data curation. Jacqueline spent 10 years working for the federal government and has taught research methods courses, uh, research method courses extensively in indigenous communities across Canada and Inuit Nundagat for two decades. Renowned public, public sociologist and award-winning public sociologist recognized by the Canadian Sociological Association and the Angus Reid Foundation for her community-based research in the advancement of human welfare in Canada. She is the author um, of the book, Tor University of Toronto Press, 2022, Decolonizing Data, Unsettling Conversations About Social Research Methods. Jacqueline is also an adjunct professor in sociology at the University of Victoria and enjoys teaching undergraduate and graduate courses at the University of Victoria and Camosun College on Vancouver Island. I had to read all of that because it is so impressive. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, in this session, Dr. Clinis will engage in conversation about her new book, Decolonizing Data Explores How Ongoing Structures of Colonization Negatively Impact the Well-Being of Indigenous Peoples and Communities Across Canada resulting in persistent health inequalities and addressing the social dimensions of health, particularly as they affect Indigenous peoples and BIPOC communities. Decolonizing data asks, should these groups be given priority for future health policy considerations? With no further ado, and with great respect, um, over to Dr. Jacqueline Quinlis to talk to us about this, her work and this um, very leading edge book. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa. I'm just wondering if um, you have a copy of the presentation handy. That's great. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so that was quite uh, an introduction and uh, it's an incredible honor. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I'm joining you from the traditional and ancestral and unceded territory of the Kwangan speaking people, Esquimalt and Wasanic nations here in Victoria. This is where I live and I also is my place of um, work. And I recognize that many of you are joining in from diverse landscapes, so I also will take a moment to honor those traditional lands and waterways from where you're joining in today. I'm really honored uh, to be invited uh, in this knowledge sharing um, and exchange with you, and I want to extend a, a really deep sense of uh, appreciation and gratitude to IPAC and, and particularly Lisa and I and many others for reaching out and inviting me to, uh, to join your conversation today. So as Lisa mentioned, I'm a second generation settler um, 
and a settler like uh, many people uh, to Canada. And I'm a biracial person of Indian ethnicity uh, from Hyderabad and Secunderabad, India, where my father, grandparents, and my ancestors were born and lived. And then I'm Irish and British uh, uh, ancestry on my mother's side. And I'm grateful to my family, and I take a moment to, to recognize uh, my family and my ancestors for their uh, support in my work and the guidance that they have provided uh, to me throughout my life. I really believe that my family, my lived experiences as a biracial person, has greatly influenced and shaped my commitment to anti-racist and anti-oppressive practice in my research praxis. So the way I think about, but also uh, how I conduct uh, my research work when I'm working in partnership with diverse groups. But before I get uh, started, I would like to take a moment to also pay my acknowledgements and my respects, uh, particularly first and foremost to Dr. Charlotte Lopi, uh, who has been a leading Indigenous health researcher for providing her reflections on the book in the foreword. Um, Charlotte has helped me in shaping my thinking uh, about my work um, and also what I presented in the book and has been a really supportive mentor to me for many years. Um, I was especially grateful to my uh, research partners at the First Nations Health Authority for shaping this work and obviously my editor um, at the University of Toronto Press for um, advancing this, uh, this manuscript, uh, which is really in a, a scholarly contribution. Um, to the literature and all of the Indigenous scholars who took time from their very busy schedules um, to participate in a peer review of this work to offer insights and di different considerations, which I ultimately think strengthen the work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you'll notice, um, just on the, and we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, on the picture here, the background is this beautiful artwork, and that is by Métis artist Chrissy Belcourt. Um, I'm very grateful for her for supporting this work uh, with her artwork, uh, which embraces its contents. Um, it envelopes the book and the pieces entitled Wisdom of the Universe. And Christy explains wisdom of the universe in a way that really deeply resonated with me and I think captures what I believe this is the spirit of the book. Um, in Christie's words, she explains that the planet already contains all of the wisdom of the universe, as do you and I. It has the ability to recover built into its DNA, and we have the ability to change what we are doing so this can happen. So the work um, that I'm going to share with you uh, over the next half an hour or so um, is about systemic change and the way that I believe that data in particular can be used to transform people's lives. Uh, before returning to academia to pursue my PhD, which was back in 2011, I spent 10 years working with Statistics Canada, so in the federal government. And during my tenure with StatCan, I designed and created research courses, managed research services, and was part of the Gathering Strength Initiative, which came out of the 1996 Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. And as a member of the Gathering Strength Initiative, I worked in numerous Indigenous communities across Western Canada and also Inuit and Inanigit, um, teaching research design courses, mostly from a quantitative perspective. And this journey offered me considerable teachings about the myriad of ways of doing good, but also very bad research with Indigenous peoples. So really the book emerged um, from my doctoral work uh, out of the University of Victoria and through support from Shirk and also um, a postdoctoral fellowship, as Lisa mentioned, with CLEAR out of Washington, D.C. But it was really inspired by many different people in different relationships. And I would like to share these stories just so you can have a contextualization for the work. But the first relationship really was with many people when I traveled um, to the country of Bhutan to the Gross National Happiness Center as part of an international delegation to learn about indigenous knowledge approaches to decolonizing the metrics of well-being. As a country, uh, Bhutan has not been, and I say formally colonized, um, and this experience and knowledge exchange has taught me a great deal about how localized Indigenous knowledge systems and larger data systems can coincide together to produce health outcomes for people that are actually rooted in what they value. And this can be tracked and measured um, over time. The second relationship is with my colleague and now longtime um, friend, Dr. Shannon Waters um, from Shamanus. And so Shannon and I met back in 2012 um, at an Indigenous data conference in Vancouver after I've just given a talk on then measuring the, the metrics of well-being. 
And uh, she approached me and um, asked me what I thought about the importance of data in health. And I told her I thought that data could be used to transform people's lives by enhancing their health and well-being. And more importantly, that data is relational. And so we connected right away and we started looking at the ways in which the First Nations Health Authority in British Columbia, which was newly emerging back in 2013, um, could be used to shift health outcomes. And so I, I share these stories just to sort of ground the work because these are relationships and these relationships are important to me and they have really helped to shape uh, the work and are at the heart of the book where I consider more diverse, equitable, and inclusive approaches to community-based research and reflect on how working with Indigenous knowledge systems and worldviews needs to be done so in a respectful way to address social, economic, and health inequalities. So in the work, I draw on both Western and Indigenous um, perspectives and methodologies to look at inequality, both from a sociological perspective, but also the two-eyed seeing approach, which was put forward by Elder um, um, Albert Marshall uh, and others to research methods. So by looking at the ways that everyday research practices, so that's the way we think about, but also we do our research, contribute to the colonization of health and social outcomes for Indigenous people. So next slide, please. So certainly, um, you know, when we think about colonization and social scientific research practices, these social scientific research practices are rooted in the disciplines to which we learn. And so those can be in social science disciplines, humanity disciplines, and also in the organizations to which we work. And so Canada does have a colonial history that continues to have a devastating impact on Indigenous peoples and communities and has influenced Indigenous peoples' efforts to shape and determine their well-being. Data gathering practices in particular, so the way that we actually come to um, our realizations and our information, have in fact created systemic and institutional forms of racism, inequality, among many other harms. And so it continues to dominate um, through a process of capitalist accumulation by dispossession, which I outline in the book through social capital analysis. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I want to sort of illuminate and I talk a lot about in the book is, you know, when we think about well-being, um, we recognize that well-being or health and wellness uh, means different things to different people at different times. So how is health and well-being measured in general and more specifically for Indigenous people? And what I do in this slide is just provide a bit of an overview or a snapshot of how um, historically uh, indicators of well-being have been tracked and measured over time. And a few things that I'd like to point out in this slide uh, for you to take away is that prior to 1970, gross domestic product was generally considered a valid proxy for average income and wellness was regarded solely in terms of economic growth. After the 1970s, as you'll see, there were many social and cultural composite measures of well-being that were developed and, and available for use at national and at international levels. By the 1990s, the human uh, the United Nations Development Program made a major contribution to the development and of composite indicators with the introduction of the HDI or Human Development Index. And today we have the Gross National Happiness Movement coming from Bhutan. And in Canada, we look at well-being um, primarily through the Community Well-Being Index and more recently through the First Nations Perspective on Health and Wellness. The thing to note about this is that it's well documented in the literature that well-being is no longer in, um, viewed as a matter of socioeconomic drivers, and I think we can all, you know, agree to that, such as education and income, but is further extended to subjective interpretations of well-being um, anchored at individual and community levels that include sociocultural factors, really that influence people and communities over life, over the life course. Next slide, please. So just a few points to note about the CWB, because it's still actively used. It was designed in 2004 by researchers and my colleagues at Indigenous Services Canada, and is used really by the Government of Canada and many other organizations, so academic institutions, provincial governments, nonprofits, um, and a variety of other sort of um, uh, institutions uh, across Canada. 
and it continues to dominate the policy arena. It, it dominates the policy arena, arena by accounting for levels of well-being for Indigenous and also non-Indigenous communities. So the values of the Community Well-Being Index are derived from four uh, main wellness dimensions, as you see here. So that includes income, education, housing, and labor force activity. And this is all based in census of population data. And so looking at this, you know, intuitively, we can all agree that, well, this doesn't seem like it's quite comprehensive, but yet, you know, the tool is still being used and, and reported on. Certainly, there are issues with using the CWB um, as, as a tool put forward by the federal government in the context of well-being, especially for Indigenous people. When we really stop to reflect and consider the fact that well-being scores are calculated for Indigenous communities, and these resulting numeric values that are assigned to each community serve as a social reproduction. It's a conceptualization of well-being that represents Western ways of thinking about well-being actually over Indigenous ways of being well. The system, I argue, actually, um, and point out in the book, uh, supports an index score approach for uh, which to close to, again, two decades has continually shown lower scores of wellness among Indigenous communities. And this data that's used that drives policy, that drives, um, you know, the implementation of programs and services feeds into what Aliyut scholar Eve Tuck has described as a damage-centered narrative about Indigenous health and well-being. So it's, it's highly problematic and really contributes to um, other forms of um, uh, violence that are inflicted on Indigenous people and communities. Next slide, please. So when we think about the data that's used to, to generate the knowledge um, and information that's acquired, data collection initiatives about Indigenous people have been part of an ongoing process, as I mentioned, of, of colonization and experience as an act of violence and genocide. In fact, the impacts of colonialism are widespread and persistent throughout many systems, so at the federal level and provincial systems, um, in terms of policies and programs and legislation that are embedded in all areas and faucets uh, of of, of life. So that includes the justice system, the educational system, the healthcare system, and the child welfare system, among many, many others. So those are just to name a few. And really, this relates to this concept of what I outline um, in my work of data colonialism. So data gathering practices have created systemic and institutional racism, among um, many other harms um, that are ever present. And it continues to dominate of the policy arena through this process of capitalist accumulation of dispossession. And the term data colonialism was coined by Professors Nick Caldry and Ulysses Maheas, just if you'd like to do some further reading on that. Next slide, please. So the adverse effects of um, contemporary colonial practices have been identified as a determinant of poor health, resulting in lower states of well-being in Indigenous communities at the individual and the community level. And at the heart of the book, I consider more diverse, equitable, and inclusive approaches to community-based research and reflect on how working with Indigenous knowledge systems and worldviews in a respectful way is important an important step in addressing social, economic, and health inequalities. So again, um, drawing on Western and um, Indigenous uh, worldviews and also methodologies, looking at everyday research practices um, as non-Indigenous researchers in the way that we think about, teach, and also um, uphold and conduct our own research, which really contributes to the colonization of inequalities and particularly um, health and social outcomes for Indigenous peoples. So one of the things I wanted to share with you is, is I mentioned that the point that data, you know, it means different things to different people at different times. And we've seen that historically when we look at, you know, sort of um, trends in well-being indicators. But knowing that, then uh, one of the things I wanted to share is that during a postdoctoral fellowship, I was working with um, academic institutions in, and throughout the United States and also the University of Victoria. And I was trying to support uh, researchers and um, students at all levels, graduate students in particular, um, to get an understanding of their data landscape. And so one of the main things I was thinking about is how can you make policy or implement programs or services if you don't know what data and what data you're working with, how it's being measured, where it's being stored, and how it's being curated. And so as you know, an institution, um, the UVic, I was really um, interested in looking at data and relationality in terms of the data lifestyle. So what data is available, where is it housed, and how is it being stored? 
Uh, next slide, please. So in this slide, it's just to sort of illustrate, and this is certainly not um, you know, exhaustive list, but data means different things to different people. And so having knowledge exchanges with a variety of different um, you know, uh, academic researchers in different social locations and in different departments and divisions uh, at UVic, you know, some of the, the feedback that I was getting that, well, data, you know, it is um, it is a community of practice. Um, it is everything. It describes an event. Uh, it's presentations, it's talks, it's knowledge sharing exchanges like we're doing today. It can be flat data, process data, unprocessed data, uh, code or script. It can be hierarchical, it can be digital. It can be represented in articles, books, websites, blogs, posts. Um, it can be a continuum over time. It's the way that we see the world. It's the lens or a worldview to which we apply um, in our community of practice and the information that we're gathering. And it can be represented numerically in plots and graphs and parameters in tables, figures, maps, stories, songs in a variety of different ways. So the whole point of this is that data is diverse and there's a, a lot of different ways in which data can be managed and stored. So when we talk about the decolonization of data, it's not just, you know, surveys and statistics um, and numbers and graphs. Next slide, please. So just to put in the context, and I really like um, situating this back in the words of people who are sort of describing this information. So speaking from, you know, researchers in a variety of different disciplines, and this certainly can be applied in, in government as well in different departments, but in the humanities, someone said, well, data is a manila, manila folder uh, in a filing cabinet. Um, that's our data. And certainly that's, you know, part of my uh, experience with data too. I still have file folders um, and, and information that I've been keeping for you know a decade or two decades um someone in the humanities also described that it's what we're creating in terms of image files uh, we're creating pdfs we're creating xml we're creating websites uh, etc all of these forms uh, of knowledge are, are data someone from indigenous studies um, told me that it's the way that our community relates to the world so it's our worldview it's got to be embedded in the sense of language, ceremony, land, or the water that you're in. And it's our histories. And those interrelationships are key to what I guess you would think of, especially in Indigenous forms of knowledge or data. Someone from the sciences explained it this way to me. It's unprocessed data. It's processed data, images, continuous live data coming in through on time, body composition, over time. And then someone from the fine arts said it's everything. Knowledge, information, stories, gossip, rumors, songs. So again, just adding to that sort of diversity of data and the way that um, people really sort of uh, exchange and interact with data in a variety of different forms um, throughout the many different types of work that they do. Next slide, please. So all of this relates back to this notion of relationality when we think about data. And I like to think of data as, you know, a continuum and time is an important consideration. Surely, surely data can be um, static. It can be, you know, measuring something at a certain point in time, but more likely than not, it has a life cycle and it can be longitudinal. And even that time series data um, is really, you know, shifts over time. And what do I mean by that? Well, data life cycle is a management and the management is a process of overseeing the entire journey of data from its creation to its eventual dispose, uh, disposal or infeasibility. Um, it involves managing the storage, accessibility, and security of data to ensure it remains accurate, relevant, and valuable throughout its life cycle. Data lifecycle management ensures efficient use of data resources and reduces the risk of data loss. And so, again, this is just to give you an example, sort of, of a circular um, life cycle of, of data within an ecosystem. But beginning with planning, there's data that is involved in the planning of a, of a project. Um, it can be involved in, in the gathering, the processing of that information, the analysis of and interpretation of that information, how it's stored and preserved, how you mobilize that knowledge through sharing in, in a variety of different formats, and then it can be reused or repurposed and have a value add. Um, again, this isn't an ex exclusive list, but it just gives you an appreciation for the sort of um, cyclical nature of data in terms of life cycles. Next slide, please. 
And so when I talk about this life cycle, management is an important part of that. So if you're new to the world of data governance and data management, I know all of this information can be a bit overwhelming. Um, over the past two decades or so, Indigenous communities and governments have been shifting the power balance around access to data about their citizens, about their community members, and the methods used to research and gather this data. And so, you know, being quite candid about, you know, research in general, the term research and data have painful connotations for many Indigenous peoples in Canada. And there are numerous examples throughout history of unethical, exploitive and otherwise harmful research studies performed by settlers on Indigenous people and communities and lands. So when an Indigenous government or community um, takes control over the data collected about their people, they gain power to determine the story. Again, going back to what Eve Tuck was saying about generating that narrative that can be used to support efforts towards self-determination and sovereignty. And so data management includes a lot of activities involved with the managing of data effectively. And it could be um, you know, stages around acquiring data, processing it, reporting on that data, implementing and maintaining technology. So there's also an element of software curation that's um, linked to data curation, describing data. So what's the documentation of that information? What's the metadata? What are the universes and languages used to describe that? And how do you manage data quality in terms of storage and protecting information? And then also in the mobilization or sharing of that knowledge. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, data curation is an important key component um, within management, and that pertains to an active and ongoing management process that involves the curation of that knowledge. So creating, sharing, and preserving of the data. So creating is the collecting and taking care of research data. Sharing is revealing the data's potential across domains. So that could include indexing, cataloging, archive, where are those stored, who has access to it, who has control over this information, and how is this knowledge sustained or preserved? So promoting the reuse and new combinations of data over time. Next slide, please. So when I think about decolonizing data, how then um, as you know, non-Indigenous practitioners and scholars and activists, can we support Indigenous data governance and management? Well, the process of decolonization is important when it comes to understanding um, Indigenous uh, social and health outcomes in the context of policy considerations. And by this, I mean engaging in a process that involves centering Indigenous knowledge systems and community voices to produce determinants of uh, health and well being that are anchored in Indigenous worldviews. And so, from my perspective, the decolonization of research within the social sciences and the institutions to which we are embedded and processes that we are tied to is about relational allyship, partnership, honoring Indigenous ethical protocols, holding space for Indigenous resurgence and indigenization, and really challenging the power structures that uphold these different systems um, to which we are working and tied to. In decolonizing my own research praxis, I've reflected about the power structures that define and uphold my thoughts and practices, and that's what I engage in in this work, and I explain how research design practices really need to be culturally responsive, which means that researchers and practitioners and community of practices like we have today um, need to work in partnership and take direction from Indigenous peoples, communities, and or organizations as they move forward with their research and to also think deeply about the extent to which theories, tools, processes that we learn, that we perpetuate are being applied um, and co contributing to either intentional or unintentional forms of colonial harm going forward. So data in itself in all of its different manifestations is a critical component in addressing inequalities um, approaching social justice and data governance is a critical precursor to all of this, which leads into data sovereignty and self-determination for Indigenous people. Next slide, please. So how then can we recognize and honor rights? Well, we have tools, one of which is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And certainly Indigenous people have the right to maintain control and protect and develop their cultural heritage, their traditional knowledge and their cultural expressions, 
which include all forms of knowledge. So again, we can kind of call that data, but that would include medicines, sacred living histories, oral traditions, and all of the ways of being and knowing that are pertained to the uniqueness and distinctiveness of um, Indigenous groups, uh, not just here in Brit British Columbia, but throughout Canada and around the globe. Indigenous people also have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their intellectual property, which again is linked to uh, self-determination and data sovereignty. Next slide, please. So how can we uphold these rights um, in, in terms of decolonization? Well, recognizing that DRIPA, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and the DRIPA Act has been implemented in BC. So the provincial government passed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, so the Declaration Act, um, into law in November 2019. And the legislation must enhance First Nation governance of First Nations data, and this will both build trust and create higher quality data. First Nations really need to participate um, in ways that they recognize data sovereignty, and this must be done with the view at the provincial level, but also with First Nations individually. So there's a lot of uh, components to upholding this. BC First Nations in particular see the potential to use data in accordance with their knowledge systems to govern and promote well-being of their communities. Again, um, working with and taking direction from First Nations leadership and communities uh, in these negotiations in, in government to government negotiations and, and partnerships. Next slide, please. So this then links to governance and, and which many people are involved in in their work, but data governance in particular includes the organizing of laws, policies, frameworks, and systems that ensure data is managed properly. And this can be a guidance and over, oversight function, which has many different key components as I've been talking about through, our pres through my presentation and, and uh, talk with you today. But decision-making bodies and structures and roles, so will there be a data governance board for working in these capacities? defining support roles, um, legal and regulatory and policy frameworks, what are the accountability mechanisms? So who is holding sort of the decision-making authority and who is accountable for that? What are the key relationships? And establishing ownership over data. So who is maintaining the ownership when data is shared? And what are these agreements? Next slide, please. So this then links to Indigenous data sovereignty, um, which can be understood as the right of a nation group of people or an individual to exercise control over their governance of data collection um, application and ownership. And data governance is the responsibility that goes along with this right. This is usually um, supported best uh, in working in partnership with Indigenous communities, again, taking direction from Indigenous initiatives and um, really respecting and holding space for those Indigenous-led initiatives to occur. Next slide, please. So this just summarizes in, in a sort of a picture some of the things that I was describing, and I know that many people like to see things visually, um, but really if we think about governance of data, that links into data rebuilding, and then data for governance can then be used for nation building. And all of this is um, interconnected in a way that really supports Indigenous data sovereignty and is linked to self-determination. So the decolonization of data in all of the different ways that, that I've shared with you is really critical um, when thinking about how this applies in, in future social policy and health considerations. Next slide, please. So just two things I wanted to leave you with. Um, the first are data principles. So what can be used to help guide some of these processes? Well, in Canada, we've got, fortunately, the First Nations Information Governance Centre, which is based um, in Ottawa, but has different regional groups across the country. And they work um, under the guise of ownership, control, access, and possession. So OCAP, and some of you have probably heard that term before. But really, that is a governing um, principle that can be used to working with um, Indigenous data, First Nations data in particular. And there are some links there if you want to watch some videos or hear about uh, FNIGC activities and OCAP in more detail. So I'll leave those slides for you um, to share. The other is um, two other principles I wanted to mention. The first are the FAIR principles, and the next are the CARE principles. So these are also tools that can be used in ethical ways of working um, in good ways and in partnership with Indigenous uh, people, communities, and organizations. The first are FAIR principles, which means data needs to be findable, needs to be accessible, interoperable between different machines and, and different softwares, and reusable. Taking that one step further, um, thinking about care principles for Indigenous data governance are really 
people and purpose oriented, reflecting the crucial role of data in advancing Indigenous innovation and self-determination. So there should be collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and again, ethics. So all coming back to the way in which these ethical relationships and agreements are put into place. So next slide, please. So just uh, to close off, and um, again, just to reiterate, uh, in the book, uh, which is available on the University of Toronto website, you can um, take a look at it there uh, or get it um, at a local library. But I outline uh, Canada's colonial history and how it has had a devastating impact and continues to have an impact on Indigenous people. And I believe that addressing the social dimensions of health should be really ranked high among future social policy considerations. And so I explore how ongoing structures of colonization have negatively impacted the well-being of Indigenous and, um, people and communities over time. And that really this has resulted in inequalities on, on many different ways uh, in terms of health, social, political, and economic inequalities. Um, I offer alternatives to doing research differently, which involves um, a decolonized approach and sort of my own teachings and learnings about research to ensure it is community driven, anti oppressive and trauma informed and decolonizing by emphasizing respectful reciprocal and ethically guided relationships. And so explaining how research design practices really need to be rooted in community value systems, be culturally responsive, and working in partnership with Indigenous peoples, communities, and organizations as you move forward in your research. Um, and thinking about you know, the tools to which you uphold in your work um, from your disciplines of where you've had your um, post-secondary training, um, really the theories, tools, and processes um, can can really contribute in unintended ways and also intended ways to ongoing um, forms of, of colonial harm. So thinking about data as a critical way to addressing inequalities and in data governance as a critical precursor to data sovereignty. So I'll close off there and I'll turn it back over to Lisa and others um, if you have any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Quinlis, um, for sharing your research, your perspectives, and your knowledge. Your work is so enlightening. Um, I think it gives us all some um, ideas uh, and, and more knowledge and, under, and understanding about how we can look at research and undertake it in a, in, a, in different ways, in a variety of ways, and in respectful and, and um, culturally appropriate and, and trauma-informed. And recognizing, I think it's interesting the way you laid out as well, um, and, and, and in your research, that data, you know, we we, we see data in a certain way, um, mm -hmm. but I think it's all encompassing, and, 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 and as we learn from you, a very broad term. Uh, so, so thank you very much. Um, and now we would like to open up the session for questions. Um, as uh, Melanie put in the chat earlier, please uh, type your questions um, into the chat, and uh, we will uh, we will go through those. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'll start with a question. All right. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so as an ally and a non-Indigenous mm -hmm. person, what are some ways that I could start to decolonize my research work within my own mm. work and my professional practice? Any thoughts on that? That's a really important question um, and a good starting place. So thank you for that, Lisa. And I think that, you know, a big part of um, our own sort of role in decolonization is thinking about where we're at. So I would say sort of really reflecting on your own identity, your own social location, and, and recognizing that a part of that heavy lifting and the work um, should be your responsibility. So I would start with some tools um, to really um, look at introductory ways of decolonizing your thinking, your own practice. And so one of the, the places that I start that was very helpful for me on my journey is um, Linda Smith's book, uh, Dr. Smith, Decolonizing Methodology. So it gave me a lot of sort of self-reflective and critical questions to think about some of these issues as I was you know, looking at what I was being taught, what I was sharing uh, in the social reproduction of knowledge, and what is my role to show up and how am I showing up in a good way so that I'm not expecting, you know, my Indigenous colleagues, friends, and family members to do the work for me. So I think that's a really important preliminary mm -hmm. place to start. Yeah. Which is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and remembering that decolonization isn't an endpoint. It is a journey. And, and I'm still learning um, humbly uh, as I work it with humility in, in different contexts and with different folks. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Jacqueline. Um, any other questions? Uh, 
Um, so I I put down a question. Oh, okay. Uh, but I can, I guess, read it out. Mm -hmm. um, as more people download Chat GPT on their phones, uh, it seems that as time goes on, more and more people will be seeking answers from artificial intelligence uh, apparatus. Um, I guess my question is: Is there any uh, best practice or caution uh, you can recommend as more uh, AI solutions are developed? It's a great question. I think always going back to indigenous sort of um, places to get knowledge is really important. Um, and so, you know, there are many different websites. I was actually writing an article today for an international uh, group and, and I had put on uh, a client indigenous climate hub as a place for people to start looking first about uh, questions they might have around uh, climate disaster and disaster uh, colonization or colonialism. And so I think, you know, just sort of speaking truthfully about that, um, making sure that you're you're looking at uh, current um, updated pieces of information. So yes, AI definitions, Wikipedia, all of that is there, but it is our responsibility to make sure that we're going to Indigenous sources, whether that's on a website or, you know, a talk, to make sure that they're credible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a good question, Owen. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I have a question. Uh, during your research and since you published your book, what has been the response to your findings and or feedback, uh, let's say, from the healthcare system? Yeah, that's a great question. So the feedback I've gotten for the book is, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm quite humbled um, by this, but I have I was I've been shocked with the level of support of this book. Um, from a variety of different places. So being invited because I my partner is the First Nations Health Authority, I think working in these health spaces, along with Statistics Canada and many other organizations, including, you know, IPAC as an example, um, really people are wanting to take the time now because we're hearing the issues about using data to highlight the systemic, you know, and uh, Indigenous specific racism that's happening in the healthcare system. So this work was very timely. Um, and I know I've had a very good, um, you know, sort of reception from academic researchers and uh, schools of public population health and public health that have really taken to this work because it's very timely with different reports that have been released um, over the last several years. I think it's the time. Um, people are wanting data. They're wanting to address issues of, um, you know, racism and Indigenous specific racism, not just embedded in the healthcare system, but in all other types of systems. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, in supporting effective evidence-based policy development, how do uh, individuals, um, yeah, how do I, I'll, how do I, how do individuals working in government systems or other organizations identify uh, the colonized practices that are occurring with respect to data data gathering, data uh, curation um, that are occurring in their in their systems? How 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 do these become known? Um, a lot, some of it is intuitive, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, in fact, I had a conversation with the provincial government today about setting up a data justice hub um, for this specific uh, issue. And so, you know, when we think about data justice, there are so many different components to that, you know, and, and I know, like, like many of you, I have worked in uh, federal organizations mm -hmm. and government organizations, and I have a lot of colleagues, I do a lot of work still in these spaces. And so thinking about, you know, even getting familiar with the terms of, you know, what is data justice? Um, you know, what is inequality? What is inclusiveness? How do these things kind of play out in this sort of data capacity? Because data is used to drive policy. And so where do these data originate from? You know, going back and thinking about, you know, even organizations where I spent with StackCan, what are the data gathering practices? Um, you know, who's informed on those um, you know, and they're called technical advisory committees when surveys are designed, but who's part of that? Like when, when you look at a, a survey tool like the Aboriginal People Survey, you know, do they have people from community, from different organizations that are part to help articulate that language um, that's being used? So I think being really honest about what you don't know, and then leaning more into asking questions about like, where did this data get generated from? You know, how how's the data going to be used? And what are the, you know, 
the unintended outcomes that could happen if this if this data was mobilized. So that comes back to Eve Tech's sort of um, you know really important uh, contribution around a damage centered narrative. So if something's being reported on, does this create more harm because people are being looked at in a deficit sort of way? And so just bringing those awarenesses, I think, is a really good starting place um, in an organization mm -hmm. um, to think a little bit more about how you can start to engage in this more critically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I have another question. This is sort of a two-pronged question. Um, and it's getting into it's sort of the big picture stuff. Um, and so what it is, given the bigger context of our country and the rest of the world, there is an ongoing societal issue of racism against uh, cultures, religions, ethnicity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Even if we can fix the healthcare system as an example, there, there are other systems that need to change too, like policing, political mm -hmm. inclusion at all political levels, education, employment, legislation, et cetera. So this is the first part. So how do we start to change the average person's thinking about indigenous and other cultures in our society? And the second part of that is what kind of systemic changes can we make in our daily life or lives to get all of us to think of and treat others in a different way to include and think of each other when we make policies and, and decide on priorities? Yeah, really good questions there. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of distill that and, and I'm gonna go back to sort of uh, teachings that, that really resonate with me. Um, and, and I think of often a Gandhian perspective about be the change you want to see in the world. And so change can often happen at, and is really important to happen at the individual level. So that's why it's an invitation in this book to really shift your own thinking about the way that you're thinking about, but also doing your work, um, whether that's with data, gathering data, or even, you know, presenting information or sharing information. Um, the the book in and of itself, you know, because I worked with the First Nations Health Authority and I used the Aboriginal People Survey and Census data to make these links, it was really a, a point to the federal government um, to really sort of look at the tools that are being put forward to critically engage in. And certainly if, you know, myself working in a research data center part time as a single mom can do this work, I, I think many other people and organizations of, you know, 3000 or 5000, uh, you know, it's an invitation to pick this work up. So the change starts with ourselves and and how we're engaging with the work that we're doing in our thinking and our practice but also this work is about being uh, situated and and yes uh, working with first nations data it has applicability to other groups so bipoc groups around the world because it's embedded in an anti-racist and anti-oppressive approach to the way that we do research generally and and when i say do research it's not just the gathering of the information it's how we're doing this right now you know like what are the ways in which we de colonize even our conversation? Um, do we show up in a heart-centered way? And do we feel vulnerable in these spaces, mm -hmm. right? And and it took a lot of courage to write this book, <laughs> um, you know, uh, because of, of the ways in which I have to challenge, um, often by myself, these larger systems. And so I would say that, you know, this has applicability, not just for, you know, First Nations, but for other groups um, in Canada, and around the globe to really reflect in the way that we're doing what we're doing and questioning where do we get our knowledge bases from? Like, you know, what are the disciplines that we've all been trained in? Mine was sociology, three degrees back to back. Some of you have been public administration. Some of you have been political science, geography, you know, start thinking about, well, where does this knowledge come from? And does it resonate with you? Because I can be quite candid. Um, and I know my discipline really well inside out in the methods. A lot of those things that were taught to me do not resonate with, with my worldview. OK, and so that was where the questioning started and and really looking at alternatives to to the way that we're engaging with these these knowledges. So I hope that answered uh, your question in terms of, you know, the applicability and, and also the usefulness of it um, more internationally. I, and I really feel like that that is kind of the case because people have been asking more and more internationally to, to share this work. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Very much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you for the great question. So I think, thank you, uh, Dr. Kunlis. I, I think we're coming to the close of our session, um, it's 4.30. 
Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for their questions. And again, to Dr. Quinlis uh, for sharing your views and sharing your time with us today, because I know you're very busy and we're honored to have you here. Um, just for all of those online, the session has been recorded and we will um, be uh, posting that on IPAC National's YouTube site and other places. Uh, so stay tuned through IPAC Vancouver. I'd like to turn now the floor over to on our board co-chair just to wrap up the event in a good way. So thank you again. Thank you so much, everyone. It was an honor. Um, I won't take too much of your time. Uh, I really do, do want to echo what Lisa is saying. Uh, thank you, Dr. Quinlis, for you know for your presentation and providing some really thoughtful and candid answers to the, the posed questions. Uh, again, I want to thank, applaud Lisa, you know, for her moderation, our event organizers, uh, especially IPAC Victoria, uh, for their support, and Erin Bellwood from IPAC National for making today's event possible. And finally, I want to thank our audience who took the time to be here today. I genuinely hope that I will see all of you uh, soon in the future, uh, whether virtually or in person. Uh, and with that, have yourself an amazing rest of uh, Thursday.